All right, Sock Prairie Youth Hockey, uh, welcome to our first talk in hockey segment. Uh, during these unprecedented times, we're going to try a new avenue to bring you some hockey content and to keep you thinking about hockey. So, our first guest is my friend Dave Ruley, who's in Middleton, Wisconsin. Dave, welcome and thank you for taking the time to talk hockey with us. Of course, Dave, it's a pleasure to be here. All right. You know, a lot of our families have probably seen you around the rink a little bit, whether it was when you're working with our high school team or, or you're coming up on a Tuesday or Sunday night to skate with one of the adult groups. But, yep. you know, they, they're probably not quite sure who you are or know much about you. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your hockey background and experiences? Absolutely, Dave. Um, first off, guys, thanks for having me on. I think this is an awesome thing that you're putting together here for all your families there in the association. And uh, hopefully over the course of this conversation, we can shed some light on some things, or at least I could give you my perspective. So um, I'm born and raised in Madison. I uh, grew up playing youth hockey for the Flyers in Madison. Luckily, I had some great coaches along the way, and we had a lot of success in the youth years. Um, went to Madison Memorial. Actually played for the Caps for a year back when they only had one or two teams and not, you know, four or five. Um and then played at Memorial until the end of after my junior year and went down to Culver Academies for my senior and post-grad year. A um, lot of fun, a lot of development, a lot of cool guys I got to play with, a lot of fun hockey. And then I went off and played at Providence College um, in the Hockey East uh, for my college D1 years. Uh, with that, I also got drafted by Montreal in the seventh round in 93. Um, so it was kind of a big obviously a big deal and a lot of fun and a really neat thing to experience and go through. Uh, after my college years, I actually got in right away and uh, was able to coach back at Culver. Um, and then I went and coached at a division three school up in Appleton, Wisconsin, Lawrence university for almost eight years, which was a heck of an experience um, being with kids and getting them up to that next level. And then I came back to Culver for a while, got to coach, their prep team, got to coach one of their varsity teams. Um, another great experience, always making relationships, getting to know people. And then I found my way back up to Madison, back to hometown, which was a lot of fun because of family and friends. And it was really nice to be able to join Middleton Youth Hockey and be a part of that for a long time. Uh, also wore some hats on the board there where I was the coaching director. And, um, you know, that obviously had some challenges at times, but it was a lot of fun. It was a great experience. I hope to shed some light on that too, as we're here today. Um, also recently coached at Middleton High School and obviously at Sauk last season, two seasons ago with Dave, which was an amazing experience as well. And then I was back at Middleton this past season um, as the JV head coach. So that that's that's the that's what I got, Dave. <laughs> yeah, hey, that's awesome. That's that's a uh... Quite a quite an array of experience, and, yeah, yeah. and we're glad to have you. And I I, yeah. I think I'd, I I do want to focus a, a lot of the conversation uh, talking about youth hockey. Yep. And, you know, in sock, you know, part of our philosophy is more than just good hockey players. We're looking to develop good good athletes. So when the traditional hockey season is over, you know, we take out our ice, and, and we encourage our athletes to get involved in other other sports. You know, that we're, we're in kind of unique times right now. You know, spring sports are already canceled. Summer sports are in question. So I guess are there any suggestions or resources you could point us to, you know, to, to, to help keep our kids developing that athleticism and hockey skills while they're pretty much in isolation? Right, right. Well, you know, I will tell you that I think that the more sports you can play from a global perspective and athleticism, is probably the best route to go for kids for a while. And I know we got a couple other questions to handle that, but um, I would say right now in this day and age, compared to when you and I both grew up, you know, what are we doing right now? You know, we're on a video chat and we have all these amazing resources at our fingertips to where I think this younger generation almost feels like they don't have to leave because they can always Google search something or do something. But, you know, I think, one of the main things right now to do for guy for kids, and I can't imagine what all the players are going through and the families. I mean, it's just really tough times. But, you know, for that kid who's at home right now and wants to get out and do something, you can always Google stick handling stuff. 
You can Google shooting and all these videos are out there, all these amazing things. But, you know, before that, I would also say that I think right now is a really good time as we all kind of slow down a little bit, you know, depending on how old you are, I really wouldn't do it for you tens and below, but maybe for, for upper aged peewee Bantam players, like honestly put together a list of goals and what you want to try to achieve long-term, short-term, just work on my shot, you know, kind of a lot of things that we discussed in a meeting just last week, but that's a really good thing to focus on. And then put it into action and take 20 minutes a day to shoot pucks or take 20 minutes a day to stick handle um, those different types of things. And by all means, you know, get out and ride your bike and be active as you possibly can during these times, because you're right. Athleticism is, is what we're after with the sport of hockey and the better athletes are always going to be probably the players that are just a step maybe ahead of some of the others. All right. Excellent. Uh, yep. I like I like a lot of what you said there. Hopefully, our our, our players that are are tuning in will yeah. take your advice and do some of that. Now, yep. out, outside of these times that we're currently in, when it when it comes overall to developing youth hockey players, I guess what are some of the key things you've learned throughout your coaching career and as the coaching director for Middleton Youth Hockey? That's a that's a very good question, Dave. And you know, when I was the coaching director for boy almost four years down in Middleton. You know, I'm in charge of the coaches and the coaches' philosophies and and what they want to, you know, how I want to see the kids develop in so many ways. Um, there are so many awesome people that are volunteering to be coaches that all they want to do is the right thing. And a lot of them just need some guidance. And I think with that and constant communication – that's something that you're going to really be able to instill in coaches. And you know what? If you find a good coach, they're not going to be able to just coach hockey, but they'll also be able to coach probably basketball and soccer and baseball. And it's how they handle the relationships with the kids. So when I look at my kind of coaching career and, and what I really have picked and chosen from coaches I've had of what I do or I wouldn't do, I would say one of the main things at the youth level is having a plan, making sure that you're executing that plan and using others on the ice to help you. But also, and I've also always told my coaches this, that, you know, 10% to 20% of your practices are what you have drawn up as X's and O's and the drills and those different types of things. 80% of your practices is the relationship building with your kids, getting them to see different ways of doing things, um, showing a lot of enthusiasm. You know, it's just like a teacher in school. Like I think we can all remember like our favorite teacher. And it was a teacher that probably brought probably more energy to class and made it fun to learn and fun to do these things. Well, it's the same with coaching and it's the same with hockey. If you can get a coach that's got games to play or kids leaving the ice with a smile and is showing a lot of passion for the game that's rubbing off on the players, you know, that's what I see is probably the most important thing for developing kids at this age. Um, letting them have fun and smiling. All right. Excellent. Yep. Some good things there. Some things I'll be sharing uh, uh, with our coaches. Yep. Um, a lot of that, a lot of that we try to do. Um, so I guess, you know, looking at since, since you and I played or, or even since you've started coaching, yep. how would you say the game has changed? Um, you know, a lot of people can say that it's become more specialized, you know, there's all these opportunities to do things all the time. And I remember growing up myself, I mean, I made my own net out of chicken wire and two by twos and did a lot of stuff on my own, just on my own. I wasn't pushed or anything like that. Um, but the game has obviously become much more skill orientated. Um, there's no doubt right now that you have to be a good skater in order to become an extraordinary player. And whether or not, you know, 
I think I think right now, obviously as a whole, look at the NHL and everything like that. It's it's so much more fundamentally sound and crisp and just fast. So it's a bigger, faster game that we play, even at the youth level now, than what we used to. And an interesting thing was I was actually because you know you look back, you know, over your career or something like that, and you'll say, "Wow, I think, you know, we were so good back in the day." You know, like we, I, these kids don't come close to where we were, you know, and I was watching a high school game with my mom this season and I'm like, mom, I'm like, you can't tell me that these kids are better than when we were playing. Cause we were awesome, you know? <laughs> and she's like, oh, sorry. And she's like, no, these kids are much better than you were, Dave. And I'm like, oh no. Um, and it's, I think it's just almost just the developmental in the and everything else in between these kids are getting so much more exposure to so many more different things to try uh, maybe more opportunity you could say to really hone their skills and get better so i do see the game bigger faster stronger at all levels right now and it starts young with that enthusiasm and then you hope to find those kids that grasp it and do it on their own a little bit, you know, um, and just make themselves into what they are. Right. You know, and, uh, developing that skill, you know, at least in Sauk Prairie, we've pretty much been following the USA hockey's ADM model. Yep. Especially at the younger levels that, you know, six U and eight U, I mean, we're pretty much doing exclusively station-based practices. Um, so, as the former coaching director in Middleton Youth Hockey, what would you say as you get a little bit older in that 10U, 12U, 14U levels, you know, what would an effective youth practice look like to you? Sure, sure. That's that's actually, I mean, one thing I really worked on with my coaches at Middleton. Um, I actually put together the practice plan for the first 10 minutes of practice every single day. And one thing that I see, and I like I really like the ADM model. It really gets kids moving right away. You know, there's not a lot of downtime at the beginning of practice once those Zamboni doors close and everyone's going on the ice. Um, and your 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 U eights and everyone are awesome. I mean, I remember slapping high fives with all the kids coming off our high school practices. And there's so much, so many smiles and so many kids that are excited to be there. And it's obviously because your coaches are doing a great job. Um, what I really like to do with practices, and it kind of changes throughout the season a little bit. Um, at the beginning of the season, you know, we're all getting on the ice for the first time. Some teams only have a week or two before their first games, or even a week sometimes before there's already games on the schedule. Um, personally, I'd rather see less games and more practices and more good practices compared to that game practice ratio we got going on right now. Um, geez, I think there's a lot of teams that it's almost one-to-one. -one. You know, you'll play, you'll have two practices, and then maybe maybe it's even less, you know, for more games pr than practices. But you really need to be able to have a good plan going into practice. When you get up into those higher levels, I know I always try to work on, you know, edge work. A lot of coaches want to, like, jump over stuff um, and fundamental learning. And I'm telling you, if I could go back and I may, if high school isn't something I continue to do, I may go grab a might team and just work with them at each age level and follow the same group of kids all the way on up and just see what happens. Um, it'd be a lot of fun because so many coaches want to put the cart before the horse, like squirts practice and power plays and silly stuff like that. When, all you need to do is work on your engagement level and practices and engagement level is like the number one thing right now. If a parent were to watch a practice and then they had a stopwatch. Okay. And not to get too technical because all these coaches are great guys and everything, but they just let the time go while their son was engaged or daughter was engaged doing something on the ice, anything skating around, but not standing in line or just sitting there watching a coach rip shots at a goalie or something like that. You know um, what we're trying to do. And there's some USA models on this too, is have 
at least 50 minutes of an entire hour of having a kid engaged in something. Okay. And that's a coach being on the ball, utilizing his other coaches and making sure that the tempo of the practice is up, you know, and that's why I'll go back to saying putting a practice plan together with drills is 10 to 20% of what the practice really is. And then the rest of it is what you bring to it. So you need to be able to adapt to the kids. They're not all going to be all gung ho all the time. Maybe they need to just play a game and have some fun, you know, um, but they need to be engaged in order to find success and develop and start keep learning. So that's, those are some of my main takeaways from practices. Um, I love ending with a game. Absolutely. And if kids are practicing at game pace and they're reminded to go to game pace, you know, maybe there's at the beginning of the season, you're working on some extra cardio or something like that to get the kids ready. But then if you can keep that enthusiasm, even through the games where they're running at full pace, you know, you got to be careful because you want to make sure you can, can sustain that energy throughout the season and not have kids come into games wiped out from practices. Yep. All right. Good. So um, maybe a follow-up on that. When it comes to the conditioning part of it Yep. for some of the older ones, um, how much time, how much ice time would you say you would devote to something like that? Or, or, or would you look for other avenues you know, I, I have found out, I mean, no kid wants to bag skate. It's not fun, right? It's in some coaches' minds essential to making their players mentally tough enough to get through a game or, you know, something of that nature. But I've always found out, you know, that, and what I've learned is that you do something else along those lines, maybe races, you know, maybe something else where it's not just this dreaded get on the line. You know, if you are going to do something like that, I wouldn't overdo it by any means, you know, because we all know once we get into the season, January, February, March roll around and coaches are searching for something to do for practices. You know, it's like we're almost out of ideas. Well, that's that's something right there where it's not just a bag skate time at that time. It should be more. Um, small, small area games, a lot of those different types of things. And if you get the kids playing at game pace and keeping them like 20, 30 second shifts doing it on and off, like you would in a game, you know, replicate the game at a high pace as fast as you can. And that's how those kids are really going to find some creativity and get better and still be in shape. Yeah. Right. I completely agree with that. Yep. Now, obviously that is, different than when you and I were growing up in, in, in a lot of ways. So mm -hmm. any advice you have for maybe some of our parents that are going to watch this or, or our coaches that are, are trying to communicate this with the parents? Because yeah. a lot of them have that old school philosophy. Sure, sure. I mean, you can look to USA Hockey. Um, they've got age-specific practice plans. If you have some people out there that want to dig that stuff up, and it'll go through a percentage of things to do. And you know what? Even when you get up into the Bantam level, that's when they first start allotting like maybe 10 minutes to systems, you know, and, and it's nothing that is overriding a practice because, you know, when you look at the squirt peewee years, probably more into peewees, that's when the kids are at their prime for learning and holding on to concepts and being able to fundamentally develop more. You know, they, they start getting it, and it's not like you're out there babysitting them as much. They start asking you questions back. They start doing those types of things. So as a parent, you know, up until your kids are through playing hockey, you know, you want, like, why are we doing this, right? Are we doing this so our kids go to the NHL, or are we doing this so that our kids through sport can learn some of the best life lessons that they've ever learned in their life without even knowing it, you know? So you need to take a step back sometimes and just kind of recharge. And this is kind of a good time to do that in our economy and with what's going on with the pandemic right now. I almost feel like I have 
a couple extra minutes each day where I can almost self-reflect on things that are going on even with myself and my family. Um, but it's something that when you are, are looking at a practice or doing this or that, is your kid having fun? You know, because every day they're being challenged to do something, hopefully, that they've never been able to do before. And if you can put your kid, yourself in your kid's shoes from the minute they learn how to skate and they keep falling down and then getting up and falling down and getting up, that sense of accomplishment and determination that your kids are then being able to absorb and then have fun with, I mean, it's amazing. So any parent out there, I would just say, you know what, Let give your kids the opportunity to do things. But it's going to be up to your kid ultimately whether or not they really want to go ahead and, and pursue it as much as maybe you wish they would. Um, but make sure they have the opportunities and then everything will play out from there. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Yep. Um, you know, I'm going to ask some, a little bit about your, your impression of, of our program. You know, you've, you've coached against Sauk Prairie teams. You've coached with our high school program. So I guess what are some of your uh, takeaways or impressions from what you're seeing from our kids coming out of our youth program? Right, right. Well, first off, it's, it's, it's the program, which I find so unique and so special, to be very honest. I mean, I've loved every minute with the SOC families and everyone I've met up there in the high school season and everybody. There's such a passion for it. And that since you guys basically run your own rink, do all of your own concessions and have a guy sharpening skates and everyone's a community and everyone's always talking to one another about how to get stuff done and chipping in when they need to, you know, and running the officials and everything else in between. I mean, the sense of pride and ownership that everybody there in SOC has with their association is what I think is so special about it. And with that, obviously, you know, you're developing some good players. Your teams have an amazing amount of success. I think all of your youth teams, maybe minus one, went to state this year. Uh, for, I think for, for the second year in a row, we all qualified for state. There you go. Yeah. I mean, what what a feather in your caps, you know? So these kids are learning, you know? They are, they are ultimately getting the exposure and the opportunities they need to succeed. And then it's just going to be up as far as further development goes. It's like, well, are you going to be the player that just takes your skates off at the end of the season and then puts them back on for tryouts? Or maybe you're going to take that next step further and maybe go to a camp in the summer or maybe do something a little bit more just for a week or something like that. But then, you know, continually work on it. So I've, I've been super impressed. I think you have some phenomenal players coming through. And uh, it's going to be exciting times for you guys. All right. Well, thank you. That's that's good to hear. And, and yeah, our uh, I guess our model's a little different where we do own the rink, and you know, there's not we have zero paid employees around there. Everything's done on a volunteer base, so it's a it's a unique situation for sure. It's it's incredible, and you guys you guys work it really well. Um. All right. So I want to. You know, the, the, these these young kids we have coming up that, you, you know, you mentioned when, when high school was coming off, you know, they'd fist bump you and they, and they got a smile on their face and everything else. Yeah. All these guys are, you know, you know and those little kids, they're, they're dreaming of, you know, playing at a very high level when they get older and, and stuff like that. So as someone that's played at that very high level and was drafted by an NHL franchise, uh, can you share some of your experiences on what it took to get there and, and kind of experiences at the different levels along the way? Sure, sure. Um, I, I was blessed. I mean, like coming up, I gave you a little bit of my hockey background when I first came up, but um, my youth team, we won Might, Squirt, Pee Wee. We didn't play Bantams because we played with um, the Capitals, uh, state tournament champions every year. We, oh, <laughs> I think we won like five. And it's just, it was amazing. Um, so I immediately, when I got into hockey and I started to be a squirt and a peewee, the camaraderie and the expectations that our coaches showed, um, and I just dug up a VHS tape <laughs> here over this break, and my son and I watched the championship game when we were squirts against Superior in like 1984, maybe, or something like that. 
and we beat them seven to one in the state championship game in Superior, you know, and it's just like, oh my gosh. So I never looked at any of that winning, um, having to do extra training or, or any of those things never really sunk into me as something I had to do. It, it kind of was what we did. And we didn't even go into a tournament saying, well, we have to win this or blah, blah, blah. Maybe we did. But the mindset for me was never win at all costs at all. It was to go out and have fun and have an assist rather than have a goal, you know? And somehow that selflessness kind of came about. So as I climbed the ladder into different levels and different types of things, different experiences, you know, it still was never to me even a job when I was playing like at Providence College. It was, it was just good, clean fun and going out there and hanging out with the guys, your family, and just having, you know, working hard and then having fun. And I think that's probably the biggest experience that I brought out of it. I never really looked at it like a job or an expectation that I had to do something. It was always for the love of the game, you could say, you know? Yeah. So, yep. All right. I, I don't know what's more impressive there, that you found the VHS tape or that you found a working VCR to watch it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yep. I get some other stories for that. We'll share later. Yeah. <laughs> um, how about How about – through all that, you know, your commitment to it versus how hard were your parents pushing you or were they kind of hands off? And this has got to be Dave's thing. You know, I think my, my parents, you have a huge, huge, when you, when you grow up and you have your own kids, you have a, a completely different respect for what your parents did for you, obviously, when you're a parent, right? And my parents went above and beyond I mean, giving me the opportunities to go to summer camps and do different things and play on a spring team maybe once or twice or, you know, just just whatever they saw, they gave me the opportunity to do. Um, but they never once told me I had to do it, ever. It was always like, Dave, there's a group of guys. Um, do you want to play like this summer? And it was a four-on-four -four league. Listen to this one. It was a four and four league in Madison when I was a junior in high school and someone just sent the rosters out a couple weeks ago of the actual players. Um, Gary Suter, Joel <laughs> Otto, Chris Chelios, Tony Granado, Donnie Granado. I mean, you go right on down the list of like all these amazing players and we got to go play with them every week, you know? Um, and I never thought anything of it when I was doing it, it was just showing up and playing hockey, which was really pretty cool. So um, that's, that's the one thing that I would um, definitely look back on in that give your kid the opportunity to say yes or no. As coaches, we want all of our kids to reach that pinnacle and, and we see what they can do. Do they always do it? No, but as long as we give them the opportunity to try then it's going to be up to them to figure out whether or not they really want to engage in it. And, um, you know, we all know if you're being told you have to do something all the time, as a kid, are you always really going to want to go out and do it all the time? <laughs> so it's, it's going to be a passion and just present the opportunities and see if they take it. Right. You know, we, we, we talked about playing multiple sports earlier. Yep. What other sports did you play as a kid? And then when did you kind of transition from those multiple sports to focusing right. a little bit more on hockey? Exactly. That's a really good question. And it is. It's all about athleticism, like we talked about. Um, I did everything. Um, I did retire from baseball when I think when I was in eighth grade and I broke my dad's heart, you know, because I baseball just wasn't for me. Okay. But I, I swam in the summers on a swim team until I got way too competitive and everyone started swimming in the winter, you know, and I, you know, that didn't work out. But it, swimming was awesome. Um, I golfed in high school. I played soccer in high school. And I played hockey in high school. So I was basically a three-sport athlete there. And um, once for me, once one season ended, I was on to the next one and then on to the next one. And maybe some hockey, maybe specific 
four on four camps in the summer or something along those lines. But um, with my personality period, I don't know how well I would do during a pandemic like this because I feel like I have to be out doing something all the time. And um, not everyone's wired like that. And maybe you are, maybe your kid's not, you know, but that's something we learn as parents too, as we grow up. Yeah. Yep. All right. Great. Uh, I, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to talk with us a little bit. I think, I think I want to go into a little bit of a lightning round here and just get All some right. quick hitter, quick hitters for you. So real Let's quick, favorite hockey move, favorite hockey moment. My favorite hockey moment, I got invited to go. Um, we were at a, at a Minnesota hockey schools, um, and I think I was a peewee. Minnesota hockey schools camp for a week, and the New York Rangers had their training camp going. And it was like, holy cow. So, like, as little, like, peewees, we'd be out there, and then we'd get off the ice, and the Rangers would come out on the ice. But one night we got invited, myself and three or four other guys got invited to go play with the Rangers. And uh, I remember scoring a goal on Mike Richter, who had just left Wisconsin, and he was actually going to be a rookie and go on to be, I think, rookie of the year in the NHL. Um, but my hockey memory for this was he made a save, stick-handled the puck through all of us down the ice, and shelved it from the top of the circles on the other Ranger goalie with all of his gear on. <laughs> and it was like, holy cow. So that's my favorite hockey moment. Uh, that's awesome. And that might lead into this next one. So who's the best player you've ever shared the ice with? Um, there's a few in college, I think that really were top, top notch. Um, some of the names are a little older. I don't know if any of them are, st I don't think any of them are still playing in the NHL, but um, Chris Drury was a big guy. We played against BU all the time. And then I think everyone knows Paul Correa. I got to play against him for a couple of years at Maine when I was at Providence. And then, um, so Drury, and then there's another guy up in Vermont by the name of, oh, it's escaping me right now, Vermont. I had it written down too, and now I can't remember. I'm sorry. That's anyway, hard. We'll say um, it again, but it's an amazing experience playing against all these guys. Yeah. So that that's the, uh, the playing part of it. How about your most memorable coaching moment? Um. I've had a number of them over the years, but I do feel, and I, I have these moments probably two or three times a year, and it kind of keeps me coaching still, like to this day, like these, these experiences when your entire team, top to bottom, is all on the same page, all committed to playing their hearts out, but playing selflessly and being super positive with everybody else on the bench. And just watching that positivity and work ethic just spread throughout a team, you know, and to the point where like, we got this game, you know, there's nothing stopping us right now. You know, these guys are dialed in and this is why you play the game. So that, that happens to me, you know, probably three or four times a year. You'd wish it more obviously as a coach, but those are pretty magical. So I always get a kick out of those. All right, last one here. When are you coming back to coach and sock again? Great question. Um, no, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed my time at sock. You guys are like no others. Um, just the most hospitable group that I've ever been a part of, to be honest. So you guys are right up there with anyone else that I've ever been experienced with or had hockey with, you know, in my lifetime. And who knows? If the opportunity presents itself, you never know what's going to happen, right? That's right. We'd be happy to have you. Um, Go Eagles. Yeah. All right, Dave. That, that's all the questions I have for you. You know, I hope you and your family uh, stay healthy and safe during this pandemic. Thank you again for taking the time to talk a little hockey with us tonight. Well, I appreciate it, Dave. Anytime. And I hope you and your family are staying safe as well. All right. Thank you. All righty.